Let's, let's gather together. Let's, uh, if you need a coffee or a donut over there, be, feel free to help yourself. Also, I got some handouts here. And if you'd like one, you're more than welcome to it. It's got 2 Thessalonians on the back. It's a long piece of paper because I tried to blow up this uh, chart on the back, and I'm not sure I did a very good job of blowing it up because when it comes to that small print, I can't even read that. So you take it home and use a magnifying glass. Or this little trick that I've learned, and that is that I take a picture of it on my phone and then I expand, right? So, but hey, Chris, how you doing? Uh, so, but in, we're going through Revelation, but as we go through Revelation, and we're going to be talking about the return of our Lord Jesus Christ, I wanted to get us right into 2 Thessalonians, which deals with the whole thing of when Christ is going to return and the second coming. And I see these youth group kids have had fun with my map, and they've erased it for me. Oh, that was a doctrine class? Robert. Who did this then? Robert. 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 Voorhees? Yes. Okay, well, Robert used to go to our church. He doesn't anymore. <laughs> we'll have to have a talk with Robert, won't we? No, we try to, you know, uh, charts, charts can be helpful, but they can also be a big pain in the patootie because they're just some things you can't chart, right? And so uh, that's, this is to try to get you to understand the difference between what it is to be a premillennialist, a postmillennialist, and an amillennialist. Again, we don't divide over that. We don't fight over it. We don't cause wars or say, say, send each other hate mail or anything like this. Hey, Corey family, how are we doing? Great. Uh, but that's there to be helpful for you. So if it's helpful, use it. If it's not, then um, you can... Do something with it. I don't know. Whatever you want to do. So let me open up in prayer, and then we'll get into Second Thessalonians and try to finish it out today. Father, uh, we thank you for your word, and um, I'm thankful that you are returning to this world that's pretty messed up, Lord. And I'm looking forward to that day that you come and gather us. I don't know when it's going to be. Today we're talking about all the things that are going to happen while we patiently wait for you to return. And Father, give us wisdom and understanding. Whatever our different views is, Father, may we never argue over or fight over them, but may we always look to you for glory because what we have in Christ and his love for us binds us together more than separates us. So may we do so for your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So now I did get my, I thought I had my thing up here. Let me make sure. I am mirroring my screen correctly to the basement. Is it working? Why am I not getting a screen here? Uh, oh, dear, 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 dear. Robert, <laughs> who did it? Robert did it. Uh, could somebody run upstairs and check in Mark Burgraff's office and see if he's there and ask him if we can get online? Thanks. Appreciate it. Tell, tell him that it's not mirroring onto the TVs. And I know it's an Apple TV connection of some kind. And it says here that I'm connected to it. This is the basement, but we're not getting anything. Okay. Man of lawlessness. So remember we left off here. Let me just review. Concerning the coming of our Lord, Paul writes... Concerning of our coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him. So this is, this is where we're going to come together with him. He says, brothers, don't be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to come from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has already come. Oh, I don't know why I'm plugged in. It says here that I'm connected to that. And uh, but nothing is coming up on the TV. I am here at the ATV basement. So, okay. So he's now going to tell us what we need to know. Verse three: Let no one deceive you in any way. Right? A deception is coming, and here it is: For that day will not come unless what? A rebellion, yeah. So you want to circle that word there, rebellion. 
What is Paul talking about here is a rebellion. He anticipates some kind of disorder that is going to take place, right? And I don't think it's uh, necessarily uh, a diversion from Jews leaving the temple, but this idea of a rebellion is the idea that's going to be connected to a man of lawlessness, uh, people who are abandoning perhaps even the faith. It's tragic to look at, but that's what happened. The church, instead of being a people of God that's teaching the word of God, we're going to see this rebellion take place. And then notice he connects it with the conjunction in verse 3, and the man of what? Lawlessness is revealed. So what do you think, or who do you think the man of lawlessness is? Literally, it means a man without law. That's what the original text is saying there, a man without law. And clearly throughout history, remember he's writing in the first century here, there are some of those who look at this passage not about the future, but they look at it in terms of historical, looking to what happened in the first century, that Paul is writing to them about an apostasy and a man of lawlessness who's been revealed and they mark it at 70 A.D. when one of the uh, rulers of that time came, declared himself to be God, and then ultimately brought destruction within the temple. But we do not know exactly who he is. It just simply says lawless one. And it's connected to the gathering together of the, us in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I see this as a future event. So whoever this man of lawlessness is, it is connected to a future event. And he tells you, don't be deceived, verse 3. A rebellion is going to come first. The lawless one is revealed. And notice this, the son of what? Destruction. Now we can translate that two ways. It could be that he is the son of destruction, meaning this, that he causes destruction, or it could be that he himself not only causes destruction, but destruction is part of the way in which he rules by bringing things down. He, he, notice what else it says. He exalts himself above every form of worship. That's what it says in verse 4. Who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship. Isn't that unique? So he's, whoever this lawless one is that is coming in, he's, he's basically saying, it's, it's all about me. I'm the lawless one. I am here, and I am not here for you to just recognize me. I am here for you to worship me. Right? Worship me. Now, historically, the Jews had some difficulty with this. And you will even notice that in Daniel's prophecy, although I'm not going to get into that right now, Daniel foresaw a time when a lawless man would come and bring about destruction. And if you look at the historical events in the book of Daniel chapter 11, you'll notice a significant time that happened about 170 AD. So as Daniel is prophesying the future, he looks forward to 170, I'm sorry, I said AD, it's BC, before Christ. And when the Romans came in and literally laid waste to the entire area of Judea. And they set up worship in the temple. A man by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes, who's one of the Ptolemies, came in and he displayed himself in the temple to be worshipped. And then he did something terrible. Do you remember what he did? He took a pig... And he sacrificed it on the altar, and he set up objects for himself in the place of the temple so that they would worship him. Can you imagine that? Now, what did the Maccabeans do? They got angry. They got upset. And they decided that they were going to revolt against the Ptolemaic Empire. And so they began their revolt. And as they began their revolt, they resorted to guerrilla warfare. And they were successful in driving them out. In fact, it was in their places where there was darkness and they could not see 
they took a lamp and they only had so much oil to light the lamp and the, I had enough for one day and let the oil in the lamp lasted for eight days. Is the story sounding familiar? Because the Jews still celebrate it today called Hanukkah, the, the, the burning of the lights, the, the oil miraculously. The average Jew doesn't recognize that anymore because they're biblically illiterate, but that's basically what happened. And so Antiochus Epiphanes was that man. Now there was also another man in 27 BC, a Roman Empire by the name of Octavius who came. He also set himself up to be a worshiper. He also set himself up to destroy law and to have everybody worship him. But again, these are all predating the book of Thessalonians. So who is this man of lawlessness? Although each one of those men in the past show us what it's going to be like in the future, they are what we might call a prototype of what is yet to come. Okay? So prophecy often does that. Prophecy often begins with an event and a prophecy, right? Take like uh, Isaiah You're good to go. 9 6. Okay, I'm good. Thank you. Take Isaiah 9 6, right? Where the text says what? For unto us a child is born, right? So we know that in the future that is going to be whom? Jesus, right? And the government shall be upon his shoulders. Well, did that happen here at his birth? Was the government on his shoulders? Well, in, in one sense, the government was on his shoulders and his providential rule, but was he actually ruling and reigning and sitting on a throne? No. That isn't going to happen until whenever the millennial kingdom comes into being way over here. So Isaiah 9, 6 contains both the first and the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, contained in one verse. And so when you look at this man of lawlessness, the one who is going to come, he's been displayed throughout history. Oh, I didn't see that. Oh, I didn't this far. I'm going to kill myself. Okay. So this man of lawlessness, we see him displayed in history all the way back in 168 BC in Antiochus Epiphanes. We see it later on displayed in about uh, 40 AD. But again, that's too soon for the man of lawlessness to be revealed. But we're going to see this man of lawlessness, according to 2 Thessalonians, happen sometime here in the future. So even though these are prototypes or what we call type of, the actual fulfillment is going to be here. And that's what Paul is talking about. He's letting us know that the man of lawlessness is going to ultimately be revealed. Remember what John says in his little epistle. He says, there are many antichrists, right? But he says what? The spirit of antichrist is already here. So in one sense, every lawless man that has ever brought worship to himself and destruction to the world is a prototype of what the full final destruction is going to be on that day. So that's what Paul is letting us know. So how we think about eschatology and the coming of all things, the Jews didn't think that way. They thought differently. Remember in Jewish eschatology, they see the old age back here and the new age and Messiah was going to come as a king. We now see the Old Testament and Messiah crucified initiating a new age called the kingdom of God, but the fullness of that kingdom has not been revealed yet. But prior to Jesus coming as Lord and King, that's when this man of lawlessness is going to be revealed. And we're trying to understand who that person is and what he looks like. I remember when I was growing up as a kid, people told me that it was Henry Kissinger. And, you know, he's still alive, I think. Henry Kissinger is still alive. And I was told how he, how he was this man going around seeking peace because it talks about how he will seek peace and then he'll turn and everybody will come about and there will be mass destruction. But as you can see, 
that doesn't seem to fit the scripture at all. So continue with our text. Uh, well, let me stop right here. Any, any questions? Any confusion? Good. All right. Got you right where I want you. Verse 4, he exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship. He takes his place in the seat of the temple. Now, what is that about? So this man takes his place in the seat of the temple. What is the temple? Temple of God, correct? That's, that's the be best built. translation of it. If you have to be built. Okay, so depending upon your eschatology, you would say if this is the temple, meaning the temple that's supposed to be in Jerusalem, is there a temple there? No. If you go up on top of the, of the area there, in the, in the holy, holy areas, the Muslims call it, there's two Muslim buildings that are there. One is the Mosque of Omar, the other is the Dome of the Rock. It's all sacred territory and ground. There's the western wall, which is the Wailing Wall, which they believe is one of the exterior walls of the temple. But there's even a lot of question archaeologically about whether that that's the actual temple mount. Is that the actual location? Why? Because in 70 AD, what happened along the route here is in 70 AD, Titus came in with his soldiers and they literally leveled the place. They literally leveled Jerusalem. I mean, there was not one stone standing upon another. And so you go to Israel today and you stand at the, at the walls of the city. And you're, you're talking huge stones, huge stones, massive stones. You can stand there at the wall and have a late temple stone at the very top of the wall and have a first century stone at the very bottom. How could, how could that be? Well, it's because those walls have been knocked down so many times and been put back up. And when they put them back up, there's no date stamp on the... There, there's no numbering system on the wall, so you can go, okay, this one goes here, this one goes here, this one goes here, and you begin to figure it all out. No. You'll see old stones at the top, young stones at the bottom, because it's been knocked down. Because when Titus came in, man, he destroyed the city. And what is interesting is this, because we're going to look at Matthew chapter 24, and I want you to understand very carefully, because this is where Paul is getting his timeline, is from Jesus, because his disciples are with him, and in Matthew chapter 24, they start asking him questions about when is the coming of your kingdom, and when is it all going to come together, and Jesus says, look around, you see these walls, see these buildings, see, these, see, see everything here? <clears throat> You're not going to see one stone standing upon another. That's what's happened in 70 AD. So, if this Antichrist comes, if this man of lawlessness comes, and he comes to the temple, does that temple mean the temple in which the Jews <coughs> worship? That's a good question. I don't know. The Bible doesn't give us the answer. Some have even tried to say that the temple is not a reference to the physical temple, but it's a reference to the church. That the church, this man comes and he demonstrates his power. He leads people astray in the church. And he, notice this, opposes and exalts himself in verse 4 against every object of worship and takes his place in the church. Remember the body, remember in the New Testament, sometimes you will say you, your body is a temple of God, Right? So what does it mean? Well, it means it's used for the glory of God. It doesn't mean it's a physical temple to be worshipped. But is that a possibility? I don't know. So if these are all signs that have to happen before Jesus comes, we don't have a temple yet. So what that means is simply this. He can't come back or the lawless one be revealed until that temple has been finished or built or constructed. And right now, there isn't any construction going on to rebuild or reframe or rework a temple. Yeah. So, so you're saying that, so you're still going on the, the, the thought that it's going to be a structure and instead of like Anderson, Sal. Anderson, Mike, Sal. Or one other. <laughs> 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 
That's, that's Jesus calling him. I got a question for him. Like it's like Jesus said when he says, I will destroy this temple, and in three days I'll rise to the Right, raise it up again. Raise it up again. Right. So I'm just wondering. If well, he's pointing to the physical temple around there. Right, the number he says destroy this temple in three days I rise it. He's not talking about. In fact, John parenthetically says he's not talking about the temple, right. the physical building. Right. But he's talking about his body. Yeah. Right. Yeah. A reference to his resurrection. Is it hot in here? Yeah. I am like <laughs> cooking. Is our do, is our AC on? Kirk, did you check and see if our AC is on? Bring him an ice cube. <laughs> Bring him an ice cube. Yeah. 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 So he, whatever he does, he takes himself in the temple, displaying himself as God. So if if he if if we're to read that the temple of God here is supposed to be the church, right? And it says, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship? Mm -hmm. So what if, it, if it's the the temple, like a spiritual temple, like us, mm -hmm. the church? Mm -hmm. Would would we? Well, that's what, that's what some try to tie it together here when he says, the day of the Lord has not come. Let no one deceive you, for that day will not come unless a rebellion comes first. They, they understand that rebellion to be an apostasy. So the church has gone into full apostasy. The church is no longer teaching the truth. In fact, this person enters the church claiming to be himself probably the Christ, the Messiah, because remember what Jesus says in Matthew 24, many will come and say, here is the Christ, go here, go there, look there. But what does Jesus say? Don't listen to him. He's not the, they're not the Messiah. But, I mean, I guess what I'm asking is, can a Christian really be deceived by the Antichrist, though? No, I don't think so. Uh-uh. So then, if that's the case, then what are we talking about? No, I, I, I think it's I think it's the temple. I, I think it's some kind of a physical building where there is worship involved as a temple. Yeah, Chris. How important is it the exact I know there's a lot of talk about the exact geographical location of the physical dome? Right, right. In your opinion, and maybe maybe no one knows the answer, how important is the exact geographical position do you think? That's a great question. Because people say if there's a temple to be built and right now, <laughs> as much as they would love to knock those buildings down and resurrect some kind of a temple there, they can't because that ground is Muslim ground, right. right? And I mean, that's what the Crusades were about, them taking Christians over there to take over the land that had been captured by Muslims and wanted to erect a holy city and a new Jerusalem and a temple. And it's gone back and forth. And so it's I just a- I wonder if they would rebuild it in another location. Yeah. Could be, I, you know, would that count? Yeah. Yeah, I suppose it's not the location that's the significant part, point. It's not the location, it is what takes place inside the temple. But, but stop and think about this for a moment, okay? The Jews practiced for centuries the sacrificial system, right? In 70 AD, that was it. No more sacrifice of lambs, no more at all completely done away with stop and think about it do they sacrifice now do they do they have animals that they kill and put blood on an altar and do they do any of that no i mean in terms of where judaism is and let me let me clarify okay in your old testament you were a jew when i refer to judaism today judaism today is not the Judaism or the Jew of the Old Testament. The Judaism today is almost a godless system. In fact, I was talking to Dr. Frankel, one of his uh, relatives or friends or something had become a rabbi. And the question that the guy asked him in becoming a rabbi is this, does he still believe in God? Because there are many Jews, rabbis today, who don't believe in God. They go to temple, they read passages out of the Pentateuch, out of the Psalms, read out of the prophets, but there is no real sacrifice that takes place today in worship. That all went away here. So what we see today 
is some different form of Judaism. And the reason we see this is because they have rejected Jesus Christ. They've rejected their Messiah. So it's weakening their whole foundation. It's, yes. The whole, Isaiah 53, the whole thing points to Jesus. There's a great interview. How many of you heard of Ben Shapiro? Brilliant, brilliant young man. Uh, used to live in Burbank. He's, he's, he's moved. Um, but he did an interview, and he does unique interviews. He did an interview with Pastor John MacArthur, and it's online. And I have never seen John so lucid and clear as he presented Isaiah 53 to Ben Shapiro. It was powerful. And I, after the end of this hour interview, I was like, Ben, are you gonna get saved right now? Are you gonna become a completed Jew? Are you gonna be one who sees the Messiah? Because he's a sharp kid, he's a smart man. And I'm waiting for that day when a young man like that comes to know Christ. And, and the Jewish people right now reject Messiah completely. But the whole point of all of this here is that when God works with the Jewish people again, Romans chapter 11, right? There is going to be a revival that takes place, and many are going to come to know Christ again. So there is, I believe, a program for his church, but also a program for the people of God. They, the book of Zechariah says, will look again unto him and whom they have pierced, and they will believe. That'll be an incredible day, won't it? Yeah. Just like the one where it says, and the Bible says, blessed are those who have not seen these and yet believe in but me. Believe in me, yes. Yeah. That, that, that's really a powerful thing. That is a powerful thing because we haven't, you know, we didn't live at the time of Jesus. We didn't see all of his miracles, right? But Seda saw the miracles. Corazon saw the miracles. And Jesus turns to those cities and he says, what does he say to them? Better is it going to be on the day of judgment for Sodom and Gomorrah than for you people who witnessed the mighty power of God and rejected your Messiah. Now you think about that. They rejected, and you know how wicked Sodom and Gomorrah was. And he says it's going to be better for them than it was for you. Man, talk about trembling words. Woo. Yeah. Uh -huh. and worked with the Jews for Jesus and said, you know, in that in the book he talked about the fact that there are a lot of Jews that are coming to Christ. Christ, yes. Yeah. Praise uh, God for those Jews. In or in, uh, Israel too. Yes, praise God for those who do that. I forgot to pass this around. This is our little attendance sheet and if your email is not on here, please put it on there and I'll, and I'll send you our, our lessons in advance. Uh, Glenn, could you be responsible to get that around all the tables? I know that's a lot of responsibility to throw on one guy. I'm retired. I'm retired. <laughs> I'm retired. <laughs> He's overwhelmed, I can tell. <laughs> so then all of a sudden, notice this. He, he exalts himself above every form of worship. Then Paul says this in verse 5. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? Oh, man. I wish Paul would have stopped right then and said, and let me remind you of all the things that I told you. <laughs> but it does tell us something about Paul, that he was the chief of the apostles and the instructor as they traveled as a team and went city to city. Now, let's get to verse 6, because this is, this is really interesting right here. Look at verse 6. And you know what is restraining him now. Okay, so you've got this lawless one who is going to be revealed. He's going to exalt himself in the temple. He's going to display himself to be God. And yet it says here, you know what is restraining him now. Right? So that he may be revealed in this time. Wow. So whoever this person is to be revealed... He is being restrained. What is it saying? Kata echo is the word there. Kata down from echo to have or to hold, to hold back or to hold down. 
to restrain is the word. So the question is, is what or who is the restrainer? If this man is evil, if this man is the lawless one, if this man is the son of destruction, is something holding him back before the full manifestation of his presence? If so, who is it? Okay, there are th three or four different answers. One is that it's the person of the Holy Spirit, right? In other words, if the Holy Spirit is operating in the world, then he is holding this man of evil from being revealed. Is it a possibility? Yes. However, there is a problem with that. It's pretty much a very opaque reference to God. And never in Scripture is there a reference that is so unclear. Second of all, if it's the Holy Spirit, it doesn't work out grammatically with the nouns and the verbs and the genders because I believe, if I'm correct, it's referred to in a neutral gender. And so, though some do believe it's the Holy Spirit, I don't see that as being the best answer. Although, it's not a bad option. It's not a bad thought, right? The church. How, th there you go, the church. Some others say the church. He's cheating. He's cheating. What's, what kind of, what's kind of a notebook? You, you got a study Bible right there. <laughs> what, what study Bible do you have? NIV. NIV, okay. Near, that's the nearly inspired version. So, <laughs> 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 sure, okay, uh, I think it's God. He's all powerful. He's, I think it's God. And God's got the plan, and he's going to do the plan. <laughs> well, but then go back and look at the text. And you know what is restraining him now, so it may be revealed in his time. So in you're, you're time. saying that it's God who is restraining you, and that God is now going to reveal the evil one in his time. And I would say, in a larger context, absolutely. <laughs> because isn't God sovereign over all things? Yes. Yeah, he is sovereign over the whole world. He is sovereign over salvation. He is sovereign when man and woman fell in the garden. He is sovereign. Amen. Also, when you talk about the temple, it says that whatever everything that God created is good. Right. So does it really matter where the temple is really built because it's good? And I know it could be in the Middle East or it could be by Israel, but in everything he created was good. Mm -hmm. So that means everything in the beginning was perfect right. in his creation. Right. And so so the specific thing where man might say this is where it has to be built because this is the only place it can be built. Right. Well, we don't even know the actual exactly. location. Exactly. Right. We don't even know the location. And there's an arch a lot of archaeological digs that are going on underneath all that whole area to find out. They found a portion of Nehemiah's wall, which is pretty cool down there. And so, it, you know, archaeology is fascinating. Have you anybody ever done that? Go on a tell or a dig or anything like that? Okay. It's, have you? Where did you go? Peru. You did? Yeah. And what did you dig up? Um, that's, that's where you found Rick. You <laughs> <laughs> Let's thaw him out. <laughs> you, 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 you remember that old Brandon Fraser movie um, where he's a caveman? Yeah. Oh, yeah. What's the name of that? I can't Encino remember. Man. Encino, Encino Man. Encino Man, yeah. And they take him up and they thaw him out and he comes alive. Always oh, cracks me up. Huh? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, but but, 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 if, but but if it's the church, then it argues for either a pre-trib or a mid-trib type of thing because the church is then taken away as the restrainer and it gets worse. But it's still in God's timing. Oh, absolutely. It's all in God's I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it's a bad option. I'm just saying... Pointing my banana at you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying, here, let me just let me throw some more options out there, okay? Because we don't know, right. right? Here's another option. What restrains him now? What is he called? He's called the man of lawlessness. lawlessness. 
How about the law being a restrainer? I think it's the Holy what? Spirit through the church. Well, that, 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 you know, if you argue for a pre-tribulational rapture, that if you have a second coming of Jesus here, and you have a pre-tribulational rapture here, then you say that the, the movement of the Holy Spirit and the church being taken out of the way precedes all this from happening. Yeah, because it says it's going to be taken out of the way. Well, so that, that, would, that would be, you kind of have to go that direction if you're pre-trib, right? Mm -hmm. That's what they do. All right, so how about the law? Does the law serve as a restrainer? Do you remember when COVID first happened? Uh, what was it, a year or so ago? And uh, this is like it's been going on forever, doesn't it? But when it first happened, I was talking to a highway patrol guy who was serving in a highway patrol at the time, and he told me that they basically were instructed not to pull over cars because they didn't want to get it or give the COVID. And I was traveling down to LA on the I-5, and when there is no law that is out there, do you realize how fast people were going? <laughs> Because the law does res is some kind of restrainer, is it not? So I, I have another idea of a restrainer that I believe, but I certainly like the idea of law being a restrainer, holding him back. So ultimately it's God, but if it's the Holy Spirit, the text says he's going to be taken out of the way. So does that mean the Holy Spirit is going to leave the earth? And if the Holy Spirit leaves the earth, how are people going to get saved? The Holy Spirit can't leave the earth. He can't. But if, but if, but if the church is gone, mm -hmm. are people going to be saved after that moment in time? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. There's going to there's gonna be people that come to know Jesus. Right? Yes. There you go. Say it again. It Michelle, say it. It says he. He. Why does it say he? The righteous Why does it say he? If it's the law, how can it say he? It is a small h. Because Caesar was law. The king is the law. Remember Paul in Romans chapter 13 when he's talking about government? Yeah. And he well, says government. He doesn't say the word government. He says he does not bear the sword for nothing. Well, who's the he? The king. The law. So it could be the law. Now, can I give you my thought on who the restrainer is? Or do you guys just want to fight amongst yourselves? All right. The word that is used there for restraint is a word that does mean hold back, okay? But let's say for a moment that I was going to restrain somebody, okay? I was gonna grab somebody and I was gonna restrain them. So I come up from behind, I can either do something with their arms or put my arms around them. Am I restraining them? Am I holding them back, mm -hmm. right? When a police officer comes and grabs somebody, they're trying to restrain that person. And the important thing about what's going on in the departments that they're trying to figure out is how do you restrain somebody without killing somebody? Because some people, when they're on PCP or whatever, they're like Superman. And it takes multitudes of officers to grab a man and to restrain him. Right? They have to, yeah, they can. They can do the chokehold, but they outlawed that. My, my friend used to call that doing the funky chicken. And that's because they put their arm around it, cut off the oxygen supply to the car carotid artery, takes about 10 to 12 seconds, and they out they go. And then when the blood supply goes back to the brain, they kind of wake up and all over the place. Yeah, yeah. right. So that's, 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 that's possibility of restraint. But the word restraint also means, just like you grab somebody, it means to seize. And here's what's interesting. When that word seize is used often in the New Testament, 
It isn't talking about holding somebody back. It's talking about when the lawless one, when the not restrainer, but when the person is seized. In other words, instead of seeing the restrainer as in opposition to the lawless one, if you translate the word seizes, it's as if the lawless one becomes seized by the power that operates the lawless one. And it's used in scripture to speak of demonic possession. Think about it for a moment. He exalts himself, takes place in the temple, proclaiming himself to be God. I was telling you things. Now watch this, verse 6. Do you now, or do you know what is seizing him now, so that it may be revealed in his time, for the mysteryness of lawlessness is already at work, only he who now seizes him will do so until he's taken out of the way. Until he's going to be revealed in the proper time. In other words, not as an opposition to him, but rather the turning on of power inside of him to be fully possessed by evil and do what is wicked. Let me give you an example. You remember Judas, right? Judas, can you imagine when the Lord took partners and divided up the disciples in groups of two by two or 70 or whatever? Somebody had Judas as a partner. <laughs> can you imagine that? Going out and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and you got Judas as a partner. But the Bible tells me he was the son of perdition from the beginning. He was never regenerate. He was never fully there. Right? Think about it. At the Last Supper, when they're gathered together in the upper room, what does Jesus say? Go and do what you got to do. Well, they're all sitting here thinking, well, Judas is in charge of the treasury. He's going to go out and give money to the poor. The Bible says Satan entered into him. Whatever was restraining him at the time, which was evil inside of him, the full demonic possession took place and manifested itself in going and betraying the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, then why did Judas kill himself afterwards because he was so ashamed of what he did? He was so ashamed of what he did. He was filled with remorse. Okay. But he wasn't filled with repentance. Remember what Paul says? There is a form of sorrow, but godly sorrow always leads to repentance, and repentance is our word there, metanoia. You're walking one way, you stop, you change, you turn around, and you go the other way. He didn't stop, turn around, and go the other way. He was like Cain. He stopped, but he felt sorry for himself. He, he, his mourning and his contrition was all about him. Just like Cain. My punishment is too, I can't, but you've caused people to suffer because of what you've done and all you can think about is you, right? It's interesting. If you've ever read anything about serial killers uh, and how they interview them afterwards and they catch them, and they're interviewing, trying to find out, you know, what's going on, what makes them work, why do they think that way. I was uh, watching a part of the interview with the Green River Killer. I don't know if you remember him years ago up there, and he killed all these people. And all he could talk about in the interview was himself and how he felt bad because on the inside, I'm really not that bad of a person. Here he's killed 70-something women, no remorse for the families, no remorse for the people that he's killed, no respect for the law. He's only worried about himself. See, that's what sin is. Like, like St. Augustine said, in curvitas in se, it's all about you. You turn it in on yourself. All you do is think about you. This man here exalts himself in the temple, 
And what does he demand from people? Worship me. Me. All about me. That's how Satan tempted Eve. Did, did he not? When he came to her, he says, Oh, God doesn't want you to do that. He doesn't want you to be as wise as he is. See, but if you take of the apple, you will know good and evil. And you will become like God. See? Sin. All about me. So, could it be that the power of this man is seized so that the man of lawlessness may be revealed? So, he has, it, this has, I think, a real strong note of self determination that this man is a man who is possessed demonically, but that ultimately is going to be possessed satanically. Let me bifurcate that for a minute. Somebody who can be demonically possessed, meaning demons dwell in you, right? The man who was called legions, you remember? Right? Christ went over to the Gazarenes afterwards, and he released this man of all the demons. Demons were inside of him, but Satan was not. Why? Satan is not omnipresent. He cannot be everywhere at the same time. He only has one place that he is at a time. However, he has legions, right, of demons. And those demons can possess. And once that house has been claimed, meaning the body has been claimed and it has demonic influence in it, maybe the full power of Satan comes and indwells this man Because it's the end time, God obviously allows it to take place, just as he allowed sovereignly Judas to do what he did. I mean, you read the book of Acts and Peter's sermon. I think it's chapter 2, verse 23, maybe 43, 23, I think it is, where he says that Jesus Christ was crucified by what? The sovereign, predetermined plan of God. He wasn't going to die any time before that. There was even a time where they took Jesus out to the hill and they were going to throw him off the cliff. But it wasn't his time to die. And that wasn't how he was going to die. In order that the scriptures might be fulfilled, he turned around and he walked straight back down that hill. Nobody laid a hand on him because it was not his time. Now, questions? Are you, are you chewing on that one? <laughs> Nick, yeah. Nick, Pastor, so you're saying that uh, the what is, in summary, that is the Satan, Satan possessing this man of lawlessness. Yeah, could that's be. That's the what you're saying. Is that, is that that what's the who that's inside of him. That's a possibility. I pref There's two, two things that I... Uh, have always held to is that this man is obviously the lawless one who's gonna, later on going to be revealed as the Antichrist. Remember you have Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. We'll get into that in Revelation 12 as we move through. But I want you to understand that lawlessness, he's the lawless one, so there is a restraint of the law. He has to act within bounds of the law. There is also a restraint of God because nothing can go forward with God but then the text says until he's taken out of the way so is God taken out of the way It'd be a really unusual way to express God doing that because God is never taken out of the way but God does let evil happen and we got to remember very carefully when we say that God is sovereign over evil remember the confession of faith we say that in all things God does allow or permit evil to happen but in such a way in which he is not the author or the first cause of evil. Right? That's very important. 1689 Confession of Faith and the Westminster Confession of Faith. So is God sovereign over everything? Yes. But in such a way where he is not the cause. So we guard ourselves there. Yes? You, you know, but God can't be present with evil in the evil. 
Yeah, I, yeah, I hear what you're saying. You know, he, if he, if God is everywhere, then how can He be present in the midst of evil? In the midst of sin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah explain he's that to above. me. Well, explain that to me. <laughs> You're asking me the great mystery of the world. I don't know. <laughs> he doesn't say, but he does so in such a way in which he's not the author of evil. In fact, um, I was reading, uh, what was I reading? I was reading, uh, I think it was Thomas Watson, Body of Divinity, uh, an old Puritan, and he was talking about hell. And he had a really interesting thought. He said this. He said, heaven is the full exposure to the glory of God, but we have a new body. We're protected. We're, we're covered. We're under the blood of the Lamb. And hell is the full exposure of the glory of God without any protection or any covering or any, any way. To, and the full, the full manifest glory just burns you incinerates you. So, so this lawless lawless one could be used like as the devil's advocate. Yes, yeah. In fact, in my Bible it says who it is. Right here. Biden. Joe Biden, right here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. I just couldn't resist that. <laughs> but but we, we, do, we do go to those Par parallels, don't we? So, so in, in, in any any time, in any place, somebody comes along and they further evil. Aren't they, in a sense, a type of the Antichrist, who will eventually come? Right? They may not be demonically possessed. They may not have Satan in it, but they keep moving this thing along. And as this thing continues to progress, what Paul is saying is, there's going to be a day when this all comes here alive. And you're going to see it. And he tells us the man, lawless one is going to be revealed. And watch this. And then the lawless one will be revealed. Verse 8. Whom the Lord will kill with the breath of his mouth. And bring to nothing at the appearance of his coming. Won't that be incredible? Just wipes them out. Now watch verse 9. This is interesting because I'm going to tie it back into the restrainer. And the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan. Satan with all power false signs wonders with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Alright, now I'm out of time but I will finish up right here God causes a strong delusion on them. What is that talking about? What does that mean? And then I'm going to begin to move forward into Matthew 24. And then when we're done with our exposition of Matthew 24, we're going to go to Revelation 4, the revealing of heaven. Revelation 5, the worship throne and the coronation. And then as we begin with the unfolding of the seals and the different judgments that will come. And you will wrestle with all of that time frame. All right, let me close in prayer. Uh, well, Kurt, why don't you come and close us in prayer? Why don't Kurt's one of our elders here at First Baptist Church and a uh, great man of God and has helped this poor pastor who needs help immensely. So It's almost ready to snow in here now. <laughs> yeah, right. I've got to go get ready upstairs. All right, blessings on you. Thank you. All right. Mm, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the, the giftedness of Pastor Mike and just the way that you have uh, just given him a mind to be able to not only understand these things but to uh, explain them and to challenge our thinking about these days that we live in. God, I pray that each and every day we wake up and we keep our eyes fixed upon you. We set our heart on things above. Lord, I pray that we would do it all to your glory. Lord, help us to understand the times that we live in. Lord, that we might be and have an urgency to go out and to uh, just share you with everybody. That we might take and bring as many sons to you as possible. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.